Hello everyone, Darwin here from CSIWindows.com. In this session we're going to go through some important PowerShell command line parameters. One of the reasons they're important is that if you are deploying uh, scripts in an enterprise environment, there's a bunch of little problems and challenges you can get completely around by using the right uh, parameters for PowerShell. So let's take a look at this. The first thing I'd like to do is I'm going to run a PowerShell command line as an administrator and I'm going to set my execution policy. Now if you've done more than the first uh, level of work with uh, PowerShell, you've probably run into execution policy. As soon as you uh, tried to run your first script, uh, PowerShell popped up and said, hey, you, you can't do that, you can't run scripts. And you probably thought to yourself, it's kind of a useless scripting engine if I can't run scripts. Um, I'm going to start up a CMD. So we just set the PowerShell uh, policy to um, restricted. I also wanted to show you that if I do a get execution policy, uh, dash list. There's actually five different contexts in which this policy could be set. And so that makes it a little bit challenging if these aren't actively managed in your environment to be what you wish them to be. They could be set by other uh, things within the system. Uh, so it's important to be able to make sure that you have a consistently the same execution policy that you think you do. It's also important to know that uh, the execution policy for machine is uh, per bitness. So the local machine policy for 32-bit and 64-bit are stored in different locations. So even if you are trying to set this globally, you need to set it once under the 32-bit scripting host and once under the 64-bit scripting host. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, we have no use for the 32-bit scripting host. We're going to run 64-bit everything. That's, that's a very good way to do it. The, the one challenge you have is anytime something 32-bit launches a script, it will launch the 32-bit scripting engine. So a good example is SCCM 2007 agents are 32-bit, even if you're running on a 64-bit system, and so your PowerShells will always launch as 32-bit on that system. Uh, so the execution policy can be kind of complicated to A, get it set up right, and B, keep it set up the way that you think it is in your environment. So we're going to take a look at a way to get around that. I'm going to now move to a CMD prompt, non-elevated, Using CMD so that when you l watch what I'm doing, you have a good analog for how you'd be launching PowerShell. If I was to start a PowerShell prompt, you know, you might be suspicious. I would be suspicious. Hey, what's going on? That maybe PowerShell has some global settings in the in the command prompt, and when I'm using PowerShell exe within there, it's affecting the execution of the scripts. So by using command exe, uh, you know that this is very similar to how you would launch uh, out of a management system or anything else. So we're going to use the file parameter to start up a script. Uh, the script I'm going to use is, oops, got the wrong drive here. And we'll go to PowerShell XE. And I've got this switches script. Um, and I'm going to attempt to run this script. And of course, because of the execution policy, we're immediately going to get a failure. Now the first way you could get around this is by using the command option. And what command does for you is it allows you to just run a piece of PowerShell code. So I'm going to say write host, hello, and just to show you how to do more than one command, we could do write host, hi back. So we get a hello and a hi back. So if we just had two or three lines, we could use this method to get code to run. Uh, it also has the benefit of it doesn't have to be saved on disk anywhere. Most likely, though, you're going to want to do more complex scripts than that. So you'd use the file parameter. So when we, we saw above, when we used the file parameter with our script there, we got blocked by execution policy. It turns out there's a command line option for execution policy. It's just straight execution policy. Note that it's not set execution policy uh, as it is in the command line. And I'm just going to run bypass, which just says, hey, don't worry, you don't have any execution policy. Do whatever you want. And then we have our file name. My core script is going to pop up two messages. So here's the first message. And it's going to pop up the second one. So now my script ran. I didn't have to set execution policy anywhere in my organization at all. So I didn't have to run some great big script or make sure all my machines are built exactly according to some standard or the next time we upgrade PowerShell, make sure the execution policy is what we think it is. It shouldn't change in upgrades, but you, know, you always get uh, suspicious when it's something you're so dependent on. So by using execution policy bypass, you can totally 
uh, avoid the whole execution policy uh, problem in business. Um, the, uh, let's also take a look here real quick at some information to summarize. Um, so the execution policy configuration uh, it has to be set on each machine before running any scripts. So that can be a challenge in itself. It is 32 and 64 bit sensitive on the machine policies and it can be set at five different levels. So there's probably like seven or eight different places that it could be set that may interfere with your script. I also have a link here to a blog where Microsoft talks a little bit about why this is not perceived to be a security problem. Um, basically it boils down to they feel that if someone can run PowerShell exe they've already got plenty of access to the system. I should also mention that you can't do anything that the, your process can't do. So if your process is running as a standard user, PowerShell doesn't have any special permissions. It's not like MSI or anything like that. And so the whole idea of code signing and setting execution policies is kind of an additional protection against automatic script execution. So let's take a look at our next bit here. Um, the next command line option we want to take a look at is going to help us with another problem that can be have where we can have something on every system that interferes with our uh, existing system. So I'm going to run uh, another admin prompt here and I'm going to say new item and I'm going to say force and I'm going to say dollar profile. Dollar profile will store where my uh, PowerShell profile is on the system even if it's not created so that'll be there and profile is a bit of PowerShell code that or can be a lot of PowerShell code if I want it to be but it's a PowerShell file that's run every time a PowerShell prompt starts up so if I'm doing something on my local machine development wise I could put a lot of cool commands in there or code that's my own that's always available every time I start the prompt unfortunately though that means when other scripts run on my system say from the management system um, that that profile will also run and that could potentially cause problems. Uh, so what we're going to do is do a notepad of dollar profile and we're going to say write host um, hi from your profile and do a new line character and then I'm going to say um, set garbage in it's not a real commandlet, so it's going to generate an error for us, and that's uh, what we kind of want to see happen to demonstrate. Uh, so now we'll hop over to our, uh, oops, uh, I don't have my CMD, here we go. Um, so now what I'm going to do is run my same uh, exact script, only this time that error pops up. Now in this case, it continues on and runs the script. Um, but obviously just an error displaying can be confusing for end users. Um, I've had a situation where people have had the SQL Tools 2008 installed on their system. SQL Tools put something in their profile and said that there was a file that needed to be loaded out of the SQL Tools folder. Um, and then when we would run scripts on those machines, they would constantly pop up this error. Now, a lot of times this won't be visible to end users, but it could be affected by, um, you know, what the uh, error action is. Uh, users could be changing different global things in their profile. In the case of the SQL install, they may not have even done anything themselves. It could have been a software install that decided it was a good idea to integrate something into the profile. So in order to get rid of this, we're going to use another command line option. Back in CMD, and that, pro that command line option is simply dash no profile. So the other reason I put hello from your profile in my profile is so that I can be reminded that um, I'm using the profile. Um, also in our class on uh, packagers recipe uh, recipes, a cookbook uh, for packagers, um, that particular class will give you code that helps you actually check if the command line had no profile in it and if it didn't well then you can uh, put up a warning. So now when we run this we skip any profile processing. It turns out there can also be multiple profiles for the machine and for the user and so there can be a lot of stuff stacked up there that might run when you run a script and this will just avoid all of it. And there's our second message. Um, notice here in the background that I am putting out to the screen the PowerShell version. So we have the PowerShell version 
and we have .NET or the CLR uh, Common Language Runtime version 4.0. So you can see both your .NET and your PowerShell version. There's some other version information listed as well. Um, one of the challenges you might have is that in your environment you might have 2.0 on a lot of machines because you haven't had a chance to upgrade them everywhere. But you have 3.0 in your development machine because it's got the cool new IDE and lots of other cool stuff. Uh, the problem obviously being if you develop on 3.0 and go try to push that code to 2.0 you may have used some new features that don't work on 2.0. I've also seen situations where 2.0 and 3.0 process very differently. Um, in one script I've seen a situation where it was actually creating uh, some sort of memory leak on PowerShell 3.0 uh, and when the person was ran it with the, the 2.0 script uh, switch that we're going to talk about it was able that memory uh, leak went away and, the, and the, it was dramatically faster. So what we're going to do here is hit version 2.0 just like that and this time when we run oops guess I have to spell version right or I have to put it in the right place I believe this one's sensitive to where it goes so it might need to be first and this time we run we get our first message and second message and here you can see we have PowerShell or PS version 2.0 Notice that the common language runtime is also rolled back. So it is fairly thoroughgoing support. It allows you to have that um, complete compatibility with 2.0. Now Microsoft has documented, I think there's four or five things that are different under 2.0 compatibility mode versus native 2.0. Uh, those items don't normally affect the vast majority of scripts, um, but there is a possibility that uh, you know, there's some slight changes, but compared, but overall, it's uh, very thoroughgoing support to back down uh, to a different, uh, to the 2.0 version. You cannot go all the way back to 1.0, uh, although I, in most cases, I do not know why uh, you would want to do that, as 1.0 is quite a bit different than uh, 3.0 if you're running on 3.0. Uh, the final thing we want to do is take a look at a switch that helps you out with another problem. It turns out that if I'm displaying a window like this, the end user can go ahead and click the X if they think that this is un unuseful. And so if you've kicked off something else that has a little UI, maybe an MSI you've kicked off, or a dialog box like you saw me do, well then they can go, oh, I want to clear this off, and they click the X and they actually kill your script. And so in order to do that, we want to hide our window. And the option there is window style, window style, and then we put our hidden. Now, one of the interesting thing about this is notice I'm in CMD, and what's going to happen is it's going to actually hi hide this prompt even though I'm starting in CMD and kicking off PowerShell. Since I'm using the exact same window, it is able to affect uh, the window even though it's a CMD. So let's give this a run. Uh, the window that I was using disappeared. This is a different one. First message, second message. Um, so you can see that, and this is the third one that I had opened earlier. So it hid that window. Uh, we, uh, it, we can't get it back, um, but uh, in the case of an end user script that you're running, you probably just want it to run and exit anyway. And I do have one more um, switch to show you, and this is the no exit switch. So if we go into, um, say, PowerShell exe, oops, dot exe, dash no, or dash, uh, well, I'm going to do version this time. We'll just uh, do no profile, and we'll, we won't hide the window either. Do execution policy bypass, and file will be our uh, switch script um, and what I'm going to do is do a no exit so usually when we do this uh, it exits the PowerShell prompt right away uh, but if I do no exit it runs it second message will come up and then we are still in PowerShell so notice here we have our PS prompt uh, so if we do a dir variable colon slash we see all the variables that were used in the script um, this can be handy even if you're running your PowerShell from another PowerShell because if a whole bunch of parameters were set during the script, you can check their final value here and see if there's something up with your, your uh, variables not being set correctly that's causing a problem with your script. 
And then if we hit exit, we go back to our CMD prompt. So that no exit can be really handy uh, if you are trying to debug or errors that fly by too quickly. Um, you can use that no exit command uh, in order to see what's going on inside that prompt. All right, let's do the wrap up on this lesson. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we covered. Uh, we talked about the PowerShell dash command um, parameter, which allows us to put in a piece of PowerShell code and have it execute. Benefits of that were we didn't have any concerns about the execution policy, what it was set to. And of course, we don't have to actually get a script file to the endpoint that we want to process on. Also, the dash file uh, parameter is the best way to execute uh, file scripts. Um, there, you will see some uh, usage out there where people use dash command and then do an ampersand and execute a script. And it doesn't execute quite the same way. And so it's important to use a dash file. Uh, also, execution policy bypass. Uh, this allows you to run your script um, and run it from any location. You can be running an elevated script off the network. Uh, bypass allows that without any uh, nagging. And uh, you have no restrictions, and it doesn't really matter what the execution policy is set to on the local client. Uh, note that this parameter is dash execution policy, not set execution policy. And no profile. No profile prevents us from running any of the user profiles that are set up for the machine or the user. And if there's any junk in them or errors or overrides to standard functions, we will skip all of that and simply run uh, what is in our scripting only. We also have version 2.0. There are two places where this helps us. One is testing on 2.0 for, for 2.0 if we have uh, that as our base level across all of our machines, even if we're developing in 3. And then occasionally it allows compatibility with scripts that use uh, specific .NET calls that may not work out uh, quite as well on uh, the newer version. And window style hidden, the big thing here is to prevent users from killing our script by clicking the X on the console if it's displaying. And then finally, no exit. No exit allows us to uh, have the PowerShell console remain open after executing our script, which means that all of the variables are remaining in memory and actually all the functions. We can run any of the functions. Uh, we can kind of start playing with it. Uh, maybe you ran a function in your script and it, it got an error, and now you could bring, uh, you could type in uh, the function and try to correct it. And if you can get it to run correctly, then you have your script code to update your script with. So no exit allows you to do some debugging uh, in a script that normally closes out by itself. So I hope that these uh, items have been helpful to you and will help you very much in getting your PowerShell scripts running everywhere in your organization. <laughs>